recording because the one thing that we do on these is we talk really good stuff and then go yeah we should have probably recorded that so um right okay um mr ward sir are you ready this is going to be done after the previous so we can refer to the prior if we 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 can say many weeks ago we did this yeah. podcast and we've never changed our clothes since. Yeah. Fucking stink. That's how it works. <laughs> well, well, think, it happens, so. Are we breaking the fourth wall? Yeah. We're breaking that sphere of oh, yeah, you know, this is very late. It's like half ten, we're just starting. Right, let's get on with it. And are you ready, John? Sorry. Yeah, that's fine, yeah. Hello and welcome to the E5 podcast. I'm JW and today we have uh, the usual people on here. So if you'd like to introduce yourselves. Hi, oh, yeah, it's David here, Sparky Ninja. Hi, I'm Paul, a.k.a. Paul. Paul. Yeah. And uh, today's guest is from uh, Dane UK. And if you'd like to introduce yourself and tell us what you'll do. Hi, yeah, I'm Sean Passant from uh, Dane UK. I'm the technical manager. Uh, I'm also here partly as my role uh, as vice president of Atlas, which is the uh, UK Lightning Protection Trade Federation. I was going to say, do you make maps? Um, that's a good joke. Late at night, eh? do you make maps? No. Um, so Atlas, I've I've never I've never really heard of them that much, and I'm sure lots of electricians. And can you tell us a little bit more about Atlas and who they are and what they do and yeah, sure. So it's a member-driven uh, trade body. Um, we started out, uh, I think we're on about 70, I think next year we'll be 75 years old. So I think that takes us back to about 1946, something like that. Wow. Um, it started out as the National Federation of Master Steeplejacks, and then it had a rebranding um, uh, about a decade ago, I think, uh, when it changed to ATLAS, which stands for the Association of Technical Lightning and Access Specialists. Uh, right. Do you think that name was made to fit the Atlas? I, don't know. I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> you never know. Good logo. Um, I'm on the site now. Yeah, Atlas has kind of two uh, wings. There's, there's the main kind of Atlas site. There's also the Steeplejack and Lightning Protection Training Group, which is a, a, a sister organization uh, that's responsible for setting standards for uh, training and MVQs um, uh, and also gaining access to other training. So if, for, for Lightning Protection people, it'd be things like PASMA and IPATH and things like that. Mm. Yeah, they, uh, they do have a website. It's atlas.org.uk if you uh, want to go and have a look there. It has a very good uh, find a member function. So if you are looking for a specialist niche subcontractor, that's where you should go. Uh, and then I've done my corporate bit. So I'm going to chip in and I'm going to start the podcast with putting the world to rights. So I, I lightning protection has always been a massive. If anyone's listened to the last podcast, they'll know it's a bugbear of mine. So I get and this, and this is the reason it's a bugbear, because um, I I'm obviously a technical guy, you know, um, you know, Sparks working in amongst non-technical people now managing client based stuff. And I look at I look at lightning protection and I just you, you get a document because someone in facilities management will say we need to do this every 11 months, although we found out in the last one, it's not necessarily every 11 months. And you'll get somebody, a company within the lightning protection industry to do a risk assessment. And that risk assessment is full of technical gobbledygook to the non-technical. Mm -hmm. And and then and then what they'll normally do is they'll do, oh, well, let's give you a summary letter that says, by the way, we've calculated that level four lightning protection is required. Well, they're not even going to know what level four lightning protection is, it is because the, the people who've calculated it aren't taking the end user on a journey of these are your obligations. This is the methodology we've used. These are the outputs. They're validated by the following clauses within the standards. And and I genuinely believe, and this is not a slur on Atlas at all, the lightning protection industry has a, a lot to do to level up, to integrate within the electrical industry, to, to win the hearts and minds of clients. Because I know, and I've been in meetings where I've said, we mustn't forget the lightning protection system having spent lots of money on cladding of a fancy railway station. Mm -hmm. And I have sat in meetings where program directors have gone, it's irrelevant, it's relevant, we don't need it, it's just a money-making scam because they don't understand it. It's a very unusual industry. 
you're right, it does need to, to kind of win a few hearts and minds, I think, and, and bring itself a bit more up to date. Definitely. It's also the, probably the only industry that will be involved when it's a hole in the ground, and they'll still be involved when you're topping out. So if you put foundations in for a living, that's all you ever do. You dig holes, you put foundations in, you don't actually see the rest of the building being built. The lightning protection guy will be there from day one when it starts being a hole in the ground he's there doing some some low level works and he'll be there right the way through that kind of reinforcing where it changes then to steel where it's then getting a rain screen cladding where it's then having the roof put on it's being topped out and then when all the fit out starts the plant starts to go in the lightning protection guy is still there um so contract period can be massively long and, and that means it's lots and lots of multiple return visits um which does make it quite difficult to program so unless you've got a really good company and a really good guy on site in terms of whoever's managing the m e package um it can be quite problematic because things get missed people forget to call you in um i was a contractor for 20 odd years and the number of times i would get a phone call at kind of half past five on a friday um can your guys be here at seven o'clock monday morning we forgot to tell you that we put that whole you know eastern wing of the building up um and that, that's perfectly normal because it's such a small part of the overall contracting package that it gets forgotten about but the industry could do more i think i do agree uh, i um just just to add a little story into that I was on a job where we had an earth farm put in um, and it was for a substation package that, that was installed into a London Underground station and you had to have dual earthing. One was the tunnel rings on London Underground. So everyone wants to know how London Underground is earthed. They use they do one earthing conductor to the tunnel rings and they also have an external earthing farm, which is normally at least nine to 12 rods. OK, um, plus then you also have that the lightning protection system as well. And I have been on so many jobs where you're bang on. Somebody has gone along and gone, I need to put a foundation in for a gate. So they'll go with a digger and dig stuff up. And you, you, I remember one day walking out of the site cabin and seeing this digger and his whole bucket wrapped in this copper tape and rods. And you're like, oh, my God, what are you doing? They're like, don't worry, it's only a bit of copper. And you're like, that's live. Important that's, copper. That's an energized, <laughs> current carrying, discharging to earth system. And you're digging it up. And they were like, is it? And that's a true story, Bob. That actually happened to me on one job. Um, it, yeah, there's. Uh, you're right. The, the guys that are doing that ever so important work, one, they are there at the start. They are there at the end. And they are very poorly communicated with because maybe it's just the quantity of the work or the dynamics of it or the lack of understanding. Again, it's that hearts and minds of the, the managing agents, the clients. Having a good person who's a good communicator is key. Mm -hmm. Definitely, without a doubt. Um, so, can I ask a question on Atlas? Yes. So, Atlas, obviously, they're effectively then the, is it fair to say you're the trade body for lightning protection system? Yep, definitely. In somewhat like the NAPITS, the NIC, EIC, et cetera, or yes. ECA, for want of a better word. The con so, um, one, of the question, one of the issues that we uh, ask regularly is uh, enforcement of good good practices and also if a contractor is in breach um do you guys do much enforcement on your members or do you do a, an arm round this is where you know do you do assessments audits on them and yeah we how do does, how do you regulate yourself so if you want to be an atlas member there is initially a desktop survey that's carried out so that's simple things like you know are you a limited company can you prove you've got insurance uh do a credit check all those kind of normal things you'd expect um prove you've got training and qualifications there's then a visit uh from somebody on the council who goes to the premises and again there's a, there's a kind of a, a check done it's simple things again uh, show us a, a a quotation show us one of your risk assessments show us your method statements show us your say systems of work etc there'll also be a case of you know let's look at your uh training matrix let's look at your plant and equipment because a lot of what is done in this industry is work at height it, it's going to be an awful lot of things like uh, let's look at your lola uh, testing regimes and things like that you know things you'd expect to see and then the final part of that is there's a site survey done as well so again someone will go out it's usually a different person as well will go to site and actually physically see them undertaking some work just so that you make sure that that risk assessment that's in the office file is also in the van of the guy that's turned up to do the job and uh, that piece of equipment that he's going to take out is it definitely got a pat testing certificate uh, etc has he actually got the right training to be putting that uh, plasma tower up those kind of things so uh, all of those things um, happen um, 
And I guess the single best thing about dealing with an Atlas member over a non-member organization is there is a complaints procedure within Atlas. If you are not happy with the service you have received from an Atlas member, you can make a complaint and that will be adjudicated on. And if necessary, they can be expelled from the organization. So um, there, there, there is a, uh, uh, a weights and measures kind of side to it. There is a way that things can happen. Hmm. Oh, Max, that stunned everyone in the silence. <laughs> he's, he's, he's muted himself. Oh, sorry, I muted myself. Well, that fills me with joy. Sorry, I, I muted myself because I was just tippy-tapping on the keys. Um, that fills me with joy because as a client, I now know there is a body that I can go actually and put a written complaint in. Um, so I'll, I'll write one on Tuesday. <laughs> I'll give you Monday and I'll write one. On Honestly, I, would, I encourage everybody to do that. And you know what it's like? You, people come across this in their own kind of um, like private sphere. If, if you're getting really bad service on your broadband, you'll just change to someone else. You might um, might send one letter or you might make one phone call, but you're certainly not going to go through a, a whole drawn out procedure. Uh, and people tend to be that that way in some of the other things they do. And if you've got a guy coming along and testing your light protection system or maintaining it and they're not doing a particularly great job, you'll find someone else. But you know what? If they're an Atlas member, you can actually let us know and we'll look into it and adjudicate that for you. Uh, and if necessary, we can make them come back and do work uh, for free at, at their cost to make sure it's put right. Sean, I think you've nailed an issue on the head there as well, is if your broadband's rubbish, you will just go to someone else. Mm -hmm. um, if your lightning protection contractor, I, I know for a fact that if if I had issues with my lightning protection contractor, at the moment I don't, I'm, I'm working with one, um, but if I had issues with my lightning protection contractor, if uh, the, the, the advice from my colleagues would be just find another one. Yeah. Now, me and Dave know from the electrical industry, if I have issues, say, with an a NIC contractor, that uh, it may be worthwhile, we'll just, okay, don't use an NIC contractor, go with an APIC contractor, or if I have issues with an APIC contractor, go with an ECA contractor, doesn't necessarily solve the problems. No. So I, I'm kind of looking forward to understanding more about Atlas, and I think maybe um, over the coming months years etc we might want to do another one of these podcasts where we kind of explore atlas and and how they do stuff in in more yeah. detail depending on the feedback and the comments uh -huh. that we get on the video because uh -huh. what we've done is introduce a new trade body to a lot of yeah. people who don't know probably existed even though they have existed for years and yes. there'll probably be lots of questions sean are, are so there any other are there any other trade bodies uh, not really for lightning protection no uh no there aren't um there was one that was started up a few years back uh and it had the it was called faults which unfortunately when you wrote it down f-o-l-p-s can be quite easily miswritten to read flops which was not necessarily the greatest of uh, of acronyms to go for no um i'm not aware that they're still functioning in any way shape or form um so um and they largely seem to be for companies who wanted to put up alternative types of lightning protection rather than stick to anything mm. that was from the snap because it's interesting because we've seen obviously I, I've been I've been kind of carefully monitoring the behaviors of the you know the electrical industries uh, mm -hmm. voluntary regulatory bodies mm -hmm. um, and I remember when I was obviously involved with the select committee and they were talking about the fact that it's good that there's competition between them because it allows them to be competitive with each other but we just saw that that was really just uh, the, comp the competition was really for them to attract subscription it was a smoke screen um, as well wasn't yeah it? completely so it's really interesting is to kind of look at this from another perspective as to how a a body like yours actually you know self-regulates but also can kind of not worry about competition from a competitor and how you can actually you know if if there is an element you know an element of improvement there with the way that you know the outputs and the way that you actually inspect and quality well, assure your 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 registered contractors mm -hmm. I'm kind of seeing that as a positive at the moment. Mm, I think that's definitely. a good thing. And I definitely think when this comes out, the volume of questions we will have, if you don't mind, Sean, once we have, we'll we'll probably get together and do another one on Atlas because I think I think it's definitely worthwhile. But I know um, we'll move on because obviously these can go into hours. Um, I've been on your site, by the way. There's some good information on there. There's like risk assessment tables and stuff. Again, so people who listen to the first podcast that we did with Sean are now listening to this other one, still thinking about that. And the academy's not open. 
yet, etc. Because you know all this is going on. Go on the site and check. There's some good information. We'll on. be there. We'll be there, literally walking into that building <laughs> when the ribbons cut with a paint paintbrush. Going right. Tell you what, let's do half day training and half days painting. Um, I'm really. I have to say, I it's definitely a place I want to go and see and. Yeah, I, and I'm sure lots of people who, who watch or listen to these podcasts, because they're obviously on nine different platforms, um, I think there'll probably be quite a lot of interest, which is why we'll put your info in the comments section on the YouTube page. Um, questions? Um, well, John, there is an issue, isn't there, we need to talk about? Yeah, if, um, this is to do with uh, BS7671 versus um, 6305, because in BS7671 there is... An entire page which has a big map of the UK on it, which yep. is to do with lightning flash density, and it's to do with this risk assessment for surge devices, which we've covered in previous podcasts. But uh, lightning flash density is also covered in 6305, is it not? And it is. Is it the same exact map in there? No, it is not. I see. And uh, could you explain really... exactly why that is and how that situation occurred? So... Okay, I would say that what has been done by uh, the 761 uh, committee is that they have kind of praised the, the rather larger and more detailed map that appears in 6305. Um, originally, the first flash density map we had worked on uh, um, contour lines, a little bit like looking at a map and, and looking at the contours of hills. It linked mm -hmm. areas of the same level of lightning activity together. They then decided they would replace that with a new one that came out in 2014. Um, if you're really interested, it's PD 6305-2014. If you want to uh, buy that from the BSI, uh, I think it's about 50 quid. Um, they've changed it now to one involving hotspots. So it shows you, uh, and as we all know, if we're into our 80s TV, what's a hotspot not? Not a good spot. Um, the hotter uh, the spot is, the more red, it means there's more lightning activity in those areas. Because there's so much information on that map, I think the wiring regs decided they would simplify it and kind of pricey it down. Um, they did the classic thing. They cut off the top, they cut off the bottom, and they went with a bit in the middle. I think right. Dave's got so emotional, he's gone all blurry. Just, just a quick one. So 6305-2, um, um, yes. it's six pages long, and it's got this wonderful coloured colored map in it. Um, yeah. yeah, wow. Boy, it's expensive. Um, but yeah, I do have I do have a copy of it. <laughs> but I have a copy of it via my subscription, so I'm Hooray. saving money. Absolutely. Anyway, sorry, um, John, is there anything else you want to add to this? Yeah, I think just generally that if say if you look through seventy seven one, it's there's a lot of references in there to six two three or five, which is the uh, lightning standard. And in pretty much every single case, it just says things like, for such and such, go and have a look in 6305. And it's, mm. it's repeated consistently throughout pages and pages of stuff. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's almost very... saying, we can't be bothered to put it in here, just no. look at some other standard and <clears throat> pay hundreds of pounds for that. It just it very much feels like me that the guys in the JPL 64 community have gone, well, these guys aren't doing lightning. They're going to go to a contractor. So let's just tell them to go to a contractor but in another way go to that yeah. book and it, it just feels like they've done that they've just i i get the impression that the jp got rid of the problem are kind of uh, they haven't integrated in my personal view it's fairly evident from what john has said and john's bang on right 62305 is mentioned repeatedly and yet we are taught fundamental principles regulation 110.2 that 62305 is exempt now, this is one of the things that does the JPL committee a complete disservice and to be honest with you, makes them look a bit foolish. Because when you then when you start a document and say in your fundamental principles, light protection is exempt and then consistently yeah, you can't do that. and repeatedly say, go and see this, go and see this, go and see this. Yeah. That says that that document is not fully coordinated. If it's mm. not fully coordinated, how can you say that this is a document for the protection of persons, property and livestock when you haven't fully coordinated it? And if just when you didn't want to just fobbed it off onto another standard, I think there's much more integration needed this is why in the last one we talked about part five inspection and testing i think it comes down to the point where there may be i don't know how many uh, surge lightning protection earthing persons there are on these jpel committees i would suggest probably not enough um i don't know on the main jpel committee um if there is anyone f who's an expert in this um 
I, yeah, can have a quick my look. colleague that you've had on before, uh, Robin, sits on one of the subcommittees. I, I know that. Well, no, that's not good enough. The, someone needs to be on. Uh, and Robin's a good guy. Don't get me wrong. Um, someone needs to be on the main committee, banging a drum well, and saying, he, um, "Look, guys." He did. He did express his frustrations with the committee behaviour. He did. Subject. Yes. Very. Well, very I clearly, fully so. support and endorse. Which we we completely agree with. Yeah. Um, at some point, they need to. Um, they need to grow up. It's not um, reciprocated either, by the way, because um, 7671 is not mentioned in 6305. It refers to the IEC source document instead. That's the that's that's what's confu I'm looking at this right now, and that confuses me as to why they've done that. Because because if they did that, then it can't be exclusive. I mean, this is their excuse. 7671 can say it's exclusive of scope because that standard does not refer to 7671. Yeah, and so 62305 refers to 60364. 60364 in the UK, if you go to 60364-1-2-3, dash dash they don't exist. They are in 7671. So, so you can't do it that way. It's, it's very modelled, uh, and I would say that as, a, as an industry, the lightning protection industry feels that kind of modelledness. Uh, <laughs> So, um, you know, we, we would we would like to be more included, uh, I think. Um, and at an earlier stage, um, we can often help reducing amount of lightning protection, amount of surge protection and cost to the end client. The sooner you get us involved, um, it's no good calling us when you've when you've built the thing, because then it's going to be ugly. It's going to be out on the outside and we're going to be drilling into things and making holes and affecting your weatherproofing. The sooner you engage with us, the more we can say, actually, you know what, if you just do that, that and that, that solves an awful lot of problems. So, so mm. this kind of this kind of leads on to a big point. I think we've probably been saying in various forms over the well, since we've all kind of met each other really um for me when i've always spoken about the wine regulations i always use the term the wine regulations is the minimum <laughs> electricians and electrical contractors will literally with pride say all our works are fully compliant to bs7671 they're fully compliant and i'm thinking to myself well that's great but also that gives me a a dreaded fear because an electrical contractor should be saying my works um, come from the wine regulations, but I, I, I integrate and I consider other other variables, other systems, yeah. other standards. The electrical industry is complex in its inherent nature to provide protection for persons and property and livestock because of the volume of standards we must read, be informed by, consider and come out with the best solution. We as an industry don't talk like that because we are piecemeal fed this is an RCD. If it don't work, you're allowed one six six seven ohms, even though that was wrong in itself. But um, yep. it, we we're bad. We we treat electricians as morons because the industry, and I'm going to go on to training, has allowed this breaking of the individual systems engineering type thinking spark although there's still lots about because there's lots of old boys who are proper thinkers, and there's lots and lots of good electricians still out there. But it's making us modular, quick, don't need to learn that, go and rely on the manufacturer, you know, go and seek advice, which is all great and dandy. But the free thinking electrician, I think, is in decline. And that kind of leads Dave onto his ramble about. Um, training Mate, I've just been listening to you talk about thinking. I feel like some kind of Sith Emperor and you're the apprentice just basically saying exactly what I've been saying for so long. It's it's so nice to hear other people kind of say for us. But you're, you're, you're exactly, you know, you're bang on, aren't you? You know, yeah, uh, we have been spoon fed this with training and moving back to um to Sean and Atlas. I mean, you, you said previously, and we haven't touched on it yet, that you, you guys have been involved with designing or creation of qualifications and training for this area. Yeah, so the Atlas do two different types of training. One is the kind of official MVQ route into the industry for mm -hmm. installers. So the guys that are physically going to site and installing it, um, and they can either go to the National Construction College at Bertram Newton and do their MVQ, um, or they can uh, start as an adult learner and go via the on-site assessment route, uh, and then proof of, of taking photographs, etc., and proving that their, their, their qualification and capability. Uh, the other thing that Atlas do, which is very much my responsibility is um, specific training for estimators, designers, and project managers. So there is an Atlas accredited course that people can sit. It's uh, two days in a classroom with me, and then a day and a half taking an exam. Um, that is only open to Atlas members. A lot of people would like to be able to gain access to that and would like to do it. Mm. 
uh, and I have to say there is a difference of opinion within the industry. Mm -hmm. Some people think that it should be opened up and other people think that it shouldn't uh, because they feel it would dilute it and, and people who only did sort of two or three systems a year would, would do it and then they would forget bits and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that is something that every single Atlas member must have at least one person that is accredited. I have to say, I, I would love to do it just to give feedback on it. I'm sure of you, if yeah. anything. I'm sure Dave would as well. Oh, yeah, definitely. So, I mean, thinking of an electrician mm -hmm. who obviously needs to get this understanding on how to develop a technical knowledge on 62305, yeah. then finally understand how it relates to their obligations of 7671 and, you know, where they, again, just so they can pass information on or handle the risk or whatever. Yeah. What is the best option? So there are a couple of, uh, non-Atlas uh, organizations that, that offer uh, awareness and training, etc., uh, <laughs> on these subjects. Um, I can give you details of some of those if you want. Uh, Are they viable? Are they, do they do lightning? Do they have the experience in your perspective? Yeah, some of them do. Some of them don't. Um, so I don't particularly want to, you know, speak badly about anyone in particular. There are some people who have... Uh, technically should be better at it than, than they are. Uh, and then there are some people who are very good at it. Um, you can do some training with manufacturers like ourselves. We, we run a variety of, of uh, courses with, in, in the process of building our academy, but we've always done training. We've always done seminars um, and they've always been available. Uh, either you come to us or we can come to you. So we do a lot of in-house training. Um, uh, that can be from as little as kind of three guys doing a two hour lunch and learn session up to an entire day where we might speak to a room full of 50 or 60 engineers. Um, so those kind of things have always been uh, available. Um, you have to kind of search some of them out. Um, and as you say, yeah, I, good. I've got thousands of electricians that obviously, you know, in, in the little networks that I've got built up mm -hmm. and many of the guys want to do some training in a field but they don't want to jump into the three-year two-year apprenticeship absolutely or, or the career change but they want yeah. enough to give them an understanding on that adventure yeah. Yeah. and you know uh they want to do more than going on a website and reading the information so um, i'm looking forward to the academy opening up because hopefully you guys will have something there and that could be probably something we can go and check out we will and um, we, we we're not in a position to announce it yet, but we're kind of no. working with a partner as well to do some of the other stuff. Um, so some of the other things that will come with that, um, there will be a, a, a partner that can deliver more practical training um, uh, in terms of climbing up high things and getting your hands dirty. Um, that's that, I've got to be honest, that, although that is my background, that's not Dane's speciality. So uh, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't want to do that, but we are mm. going to be partnering with someone. Just to remind everyone, Dane specialised in lightning protection, surge protection and earthing, if I remember rightly from our last one with Robin. That's, that's the three areas, isn't it? Yeah. And, and electrical safety products, although they're not really a big deal in the UK because we mostly risk assess out live working. But if you really do want a wet and dry hoover to clean your high voltage switch gear, then Dane are the company to come to. We can provide that for you. Wow. You'll need a bank loan, like they're really expensive. But uh, yeah, we uh, uh, in some parts of the world, Dane are much more known for their safety products. So in parts of Scandinavia, for example, um, although we're known for surge protection and, and lightning protection, we're much more known as a provider of kind of electrical safety products. So drain earths, uh, uh, voltage probes, phase comparators, all those kind of things. So um, yeah, a, a much different kind of product range in those areas. Mm. Mm. Interesting. That's, That's our yellow book. On its own, yeah. A secret book we don't talk about because no one in the UK understands it. Listen, I was going to say we could do a podcast just covering DC surge protection of PV systems. <laughs> okay, yeah. which I've, I, by the way, I've just installed quite a few hundred kilowatts of surge okay. protection. Mm -hmm. And just a quick story on that. I actually turned around to my guys and said, oh, we are putting surge protection on the DC side. The look I got was like I'd <laughs> slept with their mother. Um, but guess what? We've got DC surge protection. Funny enough, I think it's actually Dane. It's a Dane product. Good. Quite often, part of the problem with that is that a lot of the inverter manufacturers are buying devices to build in, almost like an OEM solution. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But unfortunately, 
that comes without any risk assessment, that comes without any knowledge of what they're going to do, and that device typically is a Type 2, and if it goes into a UK site and probably gets bonded, because we're a bonding country, then that Type 2 device is no longer applicable, it must be a Type 1, yeah. so it always causes a problem. Funny enough, we do actually have, hopefully, I'm, I'm yet to, well, he said he will, my PV installer should be coming on one of these podcasts. So we, it, it might be worthwhile, Sean, you just jumping in at a random point and going, ah, <laughs> and then grilling him and he should, he'll probably just go, um, oh, um, God. um, yeah. that would be quite a surprise. Um, anyway, sorry, sorry, John, we're rambling. Yeah, well, we better move on because we're uh, once again uh, running into a huge amount of time there. So uh, the point about the bonding is quite handy. That kind of links into the next item, which uh, is Faraday cages and yeah. isolated systems. Yes. So, I'd like to explain what those are and uh, what we want them for. Yeah, so I think I think most people would have at some point heard someone in light protection talk about Faraday cages, or they may even have heard the term somewhere else and, and think they understand what a Faraday cage is, particularly when it comes to, to, to lightning protection. Um, I'm, I'm here to, to burst a big bubble. We don't do Faraday cages in the UK. Uh, a Faraday cage is a system that transports all of the energy safely around the outside of someone, something, or a structure in this case. Um, and in the original experiment, uh, Michael Faraday sat in a cage reading a book and passed electrical current around himself and proved that he was okay inside. Um, because we tend to bond everything in the UK, so that's all your air handling plant, all of your um, communications antennas, satellite dishes, handrails, cable tray, you name it, it gets bonded in the UK. We're actually penetrating our own cage, as it were, because we're no longer passing all the energy around the outside, we're bringing some of that energy inside, and those electrical systems and data systems and communication systems are inevitably connected back to our MET, and so that means there is a path to Earth for lightning energy to travel down. So you've penetrated your own Faraday cage, which means it's no longer a cage. The only way to really establish a proper Faraday cage is to not bond things, and when you start not bonding things on the roof, you move into isolated lightning protection, still completely covered by 6305, still completely valid, a perfectly acceptable and, 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 uh, uh, and arguably better way of providing lightning protection, um, but not something we do very often in the UK. Uh, we do on some structures, particularly if it's uh, highly explosive or very flammable or potentially uh, nuclear, something like that, then, then you might come across these. Um, but certainly isolated lightning protection is a better way of providing protection for your end client because you just have less stuff. So uh, you work out a separation distance. It's a really easy calculation to work out. So you can work out if you need to bond those things or not, how far away you need your conductors, your air rods, etc., to be. Um, the rules that apply to cross-bonded systems, the type of system that we usually install, don't apply to isolated systems. So you can have fewer down conductors sometimes. Um, you can have l big areas where you don't have any protection at all because you've erected air rods or catenary wires to protect that volume of, of space. Um, and then you make your connection back to the MET, so your system is still at the same potential, but you do it at ground level where it's safe to do. Uh, and the reason it's safe to do it at ground level is because when you work out a separation distance calculation, the length of your conductor is one of the things you take into account. Uh, and of course, at ground level, your conductor length is zero. And simple maths, if you're gonna multiply anything by zero, your answer is going to be zero. So it's safe to do that at ground level. It's not safe to do it all the time at high level. So is the reason for us to often go for the common um, bonding route due mm -hmm. to this lack of creating a su sufficient distance or is it just more because we like to bond the crap out of things i think it's because we've gotten so used to bonding the crap out of things i think people have done it that way for years and they've always done it that way and it's very hard to get people to change and again I'm, this might be slightly personal opinion but I think and certainly I know from my own time as a contractor I've spent 20 plus years appeasing architects because one of the problems with isolated protection is you're going to need something that sticks up in the air and we all know architects want lightning protection but they don't want to see lightning protection so if you can hide it and put it under things and behind things and in things they love that but that is always a compromise on the protection. If you put conductors under the roof, which is technically possible, mm. it is not going to be as effective if you put the conductors on the outside of the roof. That just stands to reason. You know, you don't have to be a genius to work that out. Um, 
So we've been appeasing architects and we've been doing what appears to be the easiest way of doing it. But it isn't always. So, so let, I mean, me, let me get this just for my simple, simple Simon mindset here. Mm -hmm. So an isolated lightning protection system sounds like a dream. But we yes. and, and I've been on jobs where we have done buildings which were lovey, lovey, darling, darling, cladding, glass, darling, all that architecture led. And then somebody turned around and said, um, you remember that cladding system we put on the building? Yes, darling, start. we've got to take it all off like a jigsaw puzzle so that we can punch a hole through so that we can link the down conductors with this great big fat green and yellow cable and put a new piece of containment, which we'd never allowed for or properly sized or, you know, space proofed at all back to an MET so we can link all this together. Yeah. Um, we can, in, so we can basically put an isolated system as long as we have um, aerial conductors up above the roof. Now, in theory, that sounds a lot better because all you're doing is giving a discharge path straight down Correct. rather than linking it into the yeah. building and giving it a chance and to you, blow and you, something and you up. Can technically have fewer drops around yeah you have you just have fewer stuff generally speaking well, so the equipment but for isolated it, it highlights the importance again of the lightning protection being considered at the forefront of anything absolutely else. yeah yeah but, because but from the, the NAS, sorry go on please carry on dave yeah, the fundamental thing with any isolated system is using the rolling sphere okay the rolling sphere is quite a hard concept for some people to grasp but the rolling sphere is going to tell you where you need protection and where you don't and you're going to roll that imaginary ball around the building. The bits it touches need protection. The bits it doesn't touch don't. So if you can stop the sphere touching your building, you've achieved what you need to do. You've achieved lightning protection because the sphere can't touch your building anymore. If you can achieve that by putting two or three large air rods up and connecting each one of those down to a down conductor, as long as those conductors can cope with the energy they might see, you've done it. So you're not dividing your building up in the way that you would typically see on most commercial structures in the UK, meshes and meshes of conductor tape, bonds going to everything that moves, down conductors at every 20 meter centers right the way around the outside of the building. You don't have to do that with isolated light protection. So it is more expensive to buy the equipment because it's slightly specialized, yeah. but because there's less of it and you spend less time on site, it is very cost effective because you're not putting in the most expensive thing. And the most expensive thing in most projects is the actual physical manpower, isn't it? Uh, yeah. And we know that lightning protection is always going to involve working at height. And we know that if you can avoid it, you should avoid it. And we also know that CDM will tell us that anything you design, and we design lightning protection systems, it should be inherently safe to install and inherently safe to maintain. Is it inherently safe to be putting meshes of conductors over everything and bonding everything that moves when there is an alternative? I would say, no, it's not safe to do that. And it should be reconsidered. The question really is about management of the alternative, really, isn't it? Well, this... often, that's the problem is management is a struggle. So they go for the the, the, the safer alternative, which is a consideration. So of the thing we did last time. Yeah. If you don't mind me suggesting, lads, this, this comes back to something even more fundamental, which is um, asset management. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if I'm an asset manager, why has my industry, I'll oh, say electrical or, or Atlas, and why have we not produced some sort of document that basically says, when considering the selection and erection of a lightning protection system in line with these standards, um, cost safety first, obviously, and cost benefits must be considered. If we take a standard building with a, you know, four or eight tape conductor system with type one surge, et cetera, these, these are the benefits, these are the negatives. However, this uh, isolated line protection system involves less of this and do a whole life cost model, mm -hmm. then immediately you've got hearts and minds of people because you're going, hang on, that industry is really considering our whole life costing. Because at the moment, I have got systems that I have to maintain and manage um, some of them are to 6651, six, some are to BSEN 62305. I then have to weigh up, do I bring the old ones into compliance? What are the benefits? What are the disbenefits? But what I'm hearing is the isolated lightning protection system would be far better, especially on a railway infrastructure. We've got enough earthing issues. The last thing I want to be doing with the amount of transients you get on, on an earthing system anyway, is just having more things that are importing or exporting onto a railway. Um, Absolutely. And you have less SPDs with an isolated system because you've got less routes of entry into your building. Mm. That's something to think about. Good. Definitely. <laughs> well, I'm yeah, learning so, on this. This is great. I'm learning yeah. on this. This is fantastic. Yeah, it's <clears> one of those things that it should be used often, but it obviously isn't. 
and it, it fits in again with this thing in beer 7671 which basically at the moment the part about protective potential bonding pretty much says bond everything but obviously bonding everything in terms of lightning protection is not necessarily what you actually want and it, it so includes I, things like bonding central heating and air conditioning systems which by their design are going to be on the roof of the building so absolutely i always liken it to um whenever you watch any movie involving um vampires you're not supposed to invite them into your house are you that apparently they can't come in if unless you invite them in i think that's, that's right, right. I watched yeah. Lost boys uh, it's the same with lightning energy. Why would you invite it in? Why would you bond something which a really expensive piece of Mitsubishi kind of combined heating and cooling air handling plant up on the roof might cost you 10 grand. Why would you let someone drill a hole in it and attach a bit of 25 by three to the back of it? I know I wouldn't because what lightning's not clever. Lightning doesn't know that that isn't an air rod. It just sees it as a big fat air rod is what it sees. Oh, what? And it's right. Half so why would you do that when there's an alternative? He's and right, I'm sure well, because I've I've seen lightning uh, uh, air conditioning systems where the um, the extract condensers on a roof and they they put them on these special feet mm. and what you'll do is you look at the back of the feet and there'll be a ten mil bolt with a twenty five by three mil tape coming off of it connecting yeah. into a main taping system and you're thinking really are we doing all this? But then you think to yourself if there was a strike on that equipment you've got a what a six mil CPC. You know, are we really actually thinking about the segreg the coordination segregation of these systems? No. no. It's exact same in railways. Railways, what they do is they common bond the traction return into the LV of the stations. Um, and the reason being is simply when a train is in section, everything rises and falls in voltage. Why protect the people? But in the terms of fault conditions, there's a number of variables where you may have a dewired overhead line or a fault current want to go through a CPC rather than the, the route it's supposed. And that's about you then need to start thinking about system configuration. Now, where or where, and I'd love this, this is a challenge for the earthing gurus on JPL. Wouldn't it be great if somewhere in is it chapter 54 earthing? I'm going to yeah. remember off the top of my head. Oh, good. There we go. Right, cool. It would be great if it says that the that person, the person selecting, erecting the earthing and bonding system shall shall look at the configuration and the risk associated with the configuration of CPCs, bonds, earthing conductors, and LPS system six two three zero five. That would be a game changer. You're okay. welcome, industry. <laughs> Boom. Yeah, wow. that would certainly have a bit of an impact. I mean, let's face it, earthing and bonding are not exactly uh, well understood items in the electrical industry as it is. Plenty of people still get it completely wrong and mix them up and put it in the wrong places. So. Yeah, earthing's a guy from Donegal. Yeah. What I was told. Sorry, that's a bad joke, wasn't it? <laughs> is there a potential, if I had an isolated, um, an isolated system and... <laughs> Is there a potential for it to be accessible to a, let's say I've got a contractor putting a PV array on a roof. Yeah. And they've got the array and they don't, you know, they've not checked and they've decided to put some tape onto this system. Is there, is it accessible? Could it be done? And if it did happen, would it, is it potentially significantly more dangerous than if it was commonly bonded? Uh, I wouldn't say it was necessarily more uh, dangerous. The, 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 the large difference between the two kind of methodologies of protecting a building is that when you are using an isolated system, you're not really protecting the structure per se. You're protecting yeah. the volume of space. So you're taking a volume of space and you're putting in a system that will provide an area of protection around that. And that is easily mm -hmm. modeled to show exactly what that looks like. Um, so in actual fact, what it does is it makes it really easier for uh, the end client because anyone that's got a structure every time they do something on the roof when they have their test and inspection done they fail their test and inspection because there's plant on the roof that hasn't been bonded well with an isolated system you never get that because you're protecting yeah. the volume and as long as they don't infringe on the separation distance uh, and i have seen it physically painted on a roof uh, to, to make it quite obvious to people they've basically painted a yellow line and say don't put anything beyond this line uh, because that's infringing on our separation distance um it not giving yourself an issue because you're protecting the volume of space not individual items so mm. you wouldn't fail your test and inspection either uh, so it, it wouldn't necessarily make it more difficult of course some barn pot could get up there and connect into it and ruin your separation distance um 
but you know most clients manage their roof spaces fairly uh, well and fairly safely they know who's up on that roof and it'd be quite easy to go up there and look at it and think oh that's not meant to be there i'm gonna just chip in some <laughs> clients manage their roof access incredibly badly yeah. and wonder why anyone would ever have to go up to a roof space never mind said man safe systems or any other things that should mm. be maintained um trust me i have literally i have sat in rooms and gone right we're going to need to get up on the roof and do a survey the look on the face was mind-blowing and when i've said you've got a man safe system up there um yeah well you maintain it surely but it's interesting you mentioned there about you know having the roof some roofs having that painted the, the distance being painted to keep it clear i mean that's a great approach and things like 7671 can learn from that because every time I deliver a regulations course and I go to um, accessibility, maintainability, and we say that we're designing the system to make sure that the maintenance can be safely carried out for the life of the installation. And we put that onto drawings. We put a design together. And when I see designs and drawings, I'll see the plan. I'll see all the plant. But I don't see on those drawings the space that must be kept free for the life of the installation for that safe maintenance to be carried out. You know, yeah, I never can... see that. Can I just add to that as well? And um, Bizra, who do some fantastic books, guidance books, whatever, on rules of thumb for spacing of plant and equipment. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people, when they, there's lots of debates always on social media about how much space must you have in front of switch gear. And Bizra have got like pictures, good best practice guidance good for practice, gangways, yeah. all sorts, really in depth material, OM manuals, all sorts of building services, how to's, and guidance notes. And the best thing about them is they're visual guides. They're great learning material for someone who is either getting into the trade or is working in the trade for many years. I've used Bizra books in strategic meetings with Network Rail to yeah. show them that this is what industry best practice looks like. Um, so it, it definitely is worthwhile information like that if we can visualize it in any way great because at the moment people look at the wiring regulations and they look at anything to do with transients or over voltage protection and all they see is really complex formulas a flash yep. density map that is what they try to do in their language. The, and here's the thing you're on a regulations course what the trainer is trying to do is go and then they're trying to get past it yeah they're trying yeah, to run, run through, through the through training it. get through get gone then get to the bit that they are familiar with let's get to common rules in chapter 51 that four four that four 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 is confusing as fuck let's get past that and let's get to the fun bit let's talk about five one four labeling you know and then that's then that is i see that in the training room a lot and they don't just go oh hang on let's stop and let's absorb and let's take time no time for that we speak yeah. to so many electricians who who tell us that kind of story about some of their training is that they do their 18th edition course and it didn't cover surge at all no. um yeah. and when they when they kind of some of them who are a bit more well read and a bit more aware will ask that question well, what about the surge oh well you know it, it, this that i don't really know and they don't get a kind of a straight answer yeah. um it's, it's when because it, of sorry if you don't mind me saying it, it's because of those four rules those four bullet points the way we said it in a previous podcast with kirsty whereas effectively by the time you get onto the risk assessment potentially if you're on the risk assessment have you failed already mm -hmm. understanding the intent of the four bullet points but yeah. I think one of the things that we're understanding, which is a great thing, is, is even though there may not, the wine regulations may be writ of these are the four criteria, follow the criteria, there should be something that pushes us to look past that to yeah. understand the intent uh, and why we do the risk assessment. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's. Yeah. But again, I mean, we talk so much about fundamental principles. Yeah. And we hover back to fundamental principles. Chapter 13. Right. Yeah. You go on an 18th edition course, you've done that in 20 minutes because there's only four questions in your exam on that section. Yeah. Let's get to part four and part five. The most important book of the book. That's where the questions are. They fly yeah. past it. Do you know what the worst thing is? Is everybody who I've met who's come into this industry and they've, they've asked me for advice, I've told them to memorize those six pages. And some of them have actually done it and they have been better electrically than people who've done full apprenticeships yeah. because they ask the basic questions that that section asks you to ask mm. have you selected and erected it correctly are you ensuring that you're not making alterations and additions till the earthing and bond you know the one three two one six your alteration the earthing and bonding is adequate how do you deem that in t there's no lightning it should it say the earthing and bonding and lightning protection is correctly configured and in place mm. should we reword that 
that fundamental principle what does, it, what does it say in the regs i think it goes like if applicable or something like that whenever it mentions the where i think for it's regs to be considered yeah. yeah which basically means you know for the majority yeah um, absolutely so a lot of people no, what really yeah, so it, it says um, no all one three two one six. Thank God I remember the number. No <laughs> alterations, addition, temporary or permanent shall be made to an existing installation until it's ascertained that the rating and condition of existing equipment, um, including that of the distributor. Could you define existing equipment as a lightning protection system? Maybe. How how is that defined? But that uh, we'll get onto that. Um, will be adequate for the alt circumstances. Furthermore, the earthing and bonding arrangements mm -hmm. that infers that there is a configuration. In my mm -hmm. personal view, um, if necessary for the protective measure applied for the safety of the addition and alteration shall be adequate. Now, if you're putting in a socket, they're probably, that's them saying, we well, don't need to check there's a lightning protection system. You may want to go and look at the earth bar to ensure there's a connection of the fixed installation to earth because it's reliable for that. And that there's bonding to equalize potentials. But I genuinely think that that earthing and bonding arrangements should be expanded upon. As to, and, and defined as a you should look at the system mm. configuration and when you're doing EICRs look at LPS Absolutely. by the way part yeah. 5 6 2 3 0 5 is a really good baseline document it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good point because I think um, once the line protection system is there on a structure when people are carrying out additional works to that alterations uh, additions to it they are having an impact that, that may need them to do something so it's quite clear in 6305 if you have a lightning protection system every single service entry line or exit line so any cable that comes in or out of that building yeah once it's exposed to lightning energy there must be the corresponding type one lightning arrest device put on whether you want to call it an X potential bonding spd or a lightning current arrest uh, it doesn't really matter what you call it but that type one device has to be there and i always explain this to guys if you drive up to a building and you're going to be looking at that building in terms of the lightning protection system, if there's a car park entry barrier, that's being fed from somewhere inside that building. That's one type one device that you're looking for. As you're driving in, if you park up in the car park and there is car park lighting, well, that's also fed from inside. So there's going to be another type one SPD you need to be looking for. And if there's CCTV cameras, there's some more type one SPDs you need to be looking for. And that's before you've got on the roof. So if the electrician is coming back to retrospectively install some of those systems and kind of says, oh, actually, do you know what? We haven't got enough light in our car park let's get a guy in to fit them if there's a lightning protection system on that he needs to be aware that when he puts that in if he's taking it from a sub distribution board he needs to put the corresponding type one device into that sub distribution you know board. What? do you know what i'm sorry wow yeah you're right do, i think that leads us to our next question doesn't it john anyway um if i can remember where i wrote it yeah type one type one yeah. debate electricians um You've just, I don't know about you, but... You just answered it, really. Well, so if, I, if I'm going to my brain's melted. Premises, if I'm yep. working as an electrician with an existing customer that's got a line protection system with type SPD protection, type 1, every, everything like that, and I'm about to take a brand new supply out of their building infrastructure outside, under the ground, to a yep. series of column lights for a car park, yep. I'm taking services outside of the building Correct. that immediately has to comply with 6305? Yes, and it must have those corresponding and How in the heck is it outside of 7671 scope? Uh, it, it, oh. it shouldn't be, should it? Let's be honest. No, it shouldn't be. No, it but, shouldn't but, be. but more importantly is, so I've looked at loads and loads and loads of car park installations. I've looked at lots of car park designs where that car park design will have a new uh, consumer unit. That consumer unit, um, I can tell you now, I've looked at one in the last 12 months where that consumer unit had a type 2. And that was it for those circuits. Yeah. But in theory, if we did exactly what you said in the last podcast and we reviewed the risk assessments five yearly, absolutely, this would be captured and create a work bank, which yep. then interfaces with 7671. Do you know what? I would almost go to the point and say that the, the lack of uh, coordination between 62305 and 7671 is almost scandalous. Because it yeah. leads to poorly designed, poorly configured, a lack of protection. Because you're right, car park 
you've got loads of wonderful lightning conductors that yes. lightning can hit and then go straight into your system that are yeah. not being protected. So anyone listening, worth making a check. If you're an infrastructure manager or an FM, look at your car park lighting because there's tons of car parks uh, around the UK. How many of them actually have a type one arrestor on the distribute? Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Wow. It's it's other things as well that, that and again, oh, this is not, the fault of most electricians because they wouldn't actually no. realize this but if you've got a metal structure that's been used as part of the lightning protection system so i'm kind of thinking an out of town kind of pro logist type warehousing kind of place they will typically use the metal cladding and the steel frame as part of the lightning protection system the electrician will come along years later because they need another supply installing and they're going to put a little sub distribution board somewhere and they're looking and they're seeing these lovely square plum cladding hanging rails on the inside of that structure and they say oh do you know what i can hang my board off of that because that makes it nice and easy for me by doing that in a fault condition there is going to be lightning energy traveling through all of that metal work that they've connected it to which means that board has got to have a type one device in they could have moved the board five yards to the side and put it on a block work wall and it wouldn't have necessarily needed an spd in it at all so really when it comes down to positioning of things it's really really important and this is not electrician's fault but they are missing a trick sometimes with this kind of stuff um i'll i'll, I'll claim i'm guilty of that i actually did that i think it was around 2001 2002 i did that mounted a board onto a wall and there was lightning protection down conductors and it was all earthed and linked but i i think it's uh, one of the guys who was like leading the, the foreman asked a question about bonding and stuff but surge was never even mentioned um, you're right, Bob. Well, you're effectively putting a big metal link mm -hmm. between your CPCs, um, your segregated system, um, and your your down your down conductors. And this is what I keep bleating on about um, about configuration management. When you're looking at an electrical installation and you're designing a small 1.5, 2.5, 4 mil, 6 mil CPC, where are you running it? What's it parallel to? And can it be breached, bypassed, etc.? Because if you do that, and, and the best per, the best way for me explaining it is when you're on a railway platform and you've got a 2.5 mil lighting circuit and that's connected into a light fitting. If that light fitting is metal, it's bonded into a big steel structure. That steel, steel structure has got 152 mil bond, which is connected directly to traction return. So when that train is in section, that CPC is linked to the traction return of the train. Our electrical systems aren't designed for that, but don't worry. Section 110.2 says traction systems are exempt <laughs> from 7671. And this is why um, I have, and, and I'm going to say this in the podcast, uh, there should be a special locations for railways that allows an electrical contractor to succeed in the implementation of 7671. Otherwise, 7671 stays as a minimum, almost useless document. And the only reason it's almost used is because fundamental principles are the baseline for that entire document. The rest of it is guidance of implementation. And it's fairly evident there are gaps, there's missing parts, and it could be better. Um, but that's just my personal opinion. Um, wow. <laughs> but it's worth, it's worth saying that's an opinion you've got because it's a problem you've got. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Without a yeah, doubt. We've, we've seen measurements of that not, 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 uh, not long ago. Of you actually having currents on your system on your net on your network, so a little bit of energy, small smidgen small amount bit, of energy. But the, point, the point is, it's in the earthing. You know, if the regulations don't, you know, don't account for you to be able to control or work or accept that. And, and the trouble scope. is, as well, is the industry sometimes want to bury their head in the sands on mm -hmm. stuff that you can't see, you can't touch, you can't smell, you can't hear. Mm -hmm. They will bury their heads in the sand and go, well, "We've never had a problem." The problem is you do have a problem because what you'll do is you'll then look at your failure rates of your systems. You'll then look at the life of a system and wonder why its insulation resistance values are degrading. It's because it's being bombarded by transients, stuff yeah. that shouldn't be there, and external influences that are putting those cables and those systems under undue pressure that they're not designed for nor protected for. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that would that would completely echo everything that that, that, that Dane kind of uh, teaches and philosophizes about is is that um, people don't know that they've got a problem um, and people almost never put it down to 
where it could have come from. So, you know, surge protection is not a new thing. It's, it's existed since 1952. Dane invented the very first device back in 1952. Um, so we've had it for a long time. So these issues have clearly been around for a long time. And unfortunately, again, getting back to the thing about people complaining and they can't really be bothered. If something breaks, you never think, oh, that was because there was a, uh, some lightning uh, about a week ago and we could have been subjected to a transient and now this has, has failed. People never, ever think that. They don't think no. that the guy on the end of their uh, row of industrial units um, does loads and loads of metal fabrication and welding and that welding equipment is having a huge inductive load that keeps going on and off and on and off um, and so that's causing spikes and transients and issues they never think about those things they just think well that phone system I bought for X number of thousands of pounds is rubbish I'll have to go and buy another one now they don't think that actually there's an underlying problem here that could be solved with a relatively simple cost effective device that it just doesn't enter into it and I guess as an industry we've all got to help with that and that's the problem is because I think where the industry hasn't done a good hearts and minds job they've uh, it's all the conversation has gone very quickly to we can sell you a device mm -hmm. rather than let us help let us identify any risk let us yeah. help you come up with a solution yeah, yeah. Yeah. um I've always said to my contractors you are uh, absolutely duty bound if you want my money to discharge any duties that you find where there could be a gap or give me um, risk to my passengers, my infrastructure. But it's uh, it's very difficult because I kind of a lot of the time sit and know more than them at times. Um, and it's like, how does this industry level up these guys? And I think the Dane, once your academy's up and running i think people are going to have loads of questions on this so we'll probably end up most certainly doing a third one i can definitely think of and i'm gonna i'm gonna put this out there i think we should definitely get you and kirsty on one of these and we do a uh, a joint one where we just talk about surge protection and maybe some of the questions that we've been asked on the previous podcast we we do a mock up <clears> with both people so that we can debate yeah. it a bit more. it'll be good it'll be good to get some information on what we can see happening with the future of 444 as well with 7671 if they're going to do anything to the mess that it is in right now well whoever's yeah. on the wine rigs committee in dane have our full blessing and support to kick off <laughs> and appreciation for the struggles yes yes <laughs> absolutely we've um, got you back yeah um because we i mean my perspective is obviously i mean yeah 62305 if it's referring to 60364 7671 needs to say oh they're talking about us yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. um we are really <laughs> because you are <laughs> yeah yeah we're um, yeah, honest and so they need they need to they need to bring that in and um and bring it within scope for its considered application and then we can get electricians actually seeking that further bit of improvement to comply yeah little yeah, baby steps right yeah i mean ultimately this scope thing about this one there's there's piles of stuff which allegedly isn't in the scope but in reality it is and you can't just say here's an electric installation oh. that just happens to be next to something else because it's all connected yeah. together anyway. So I mean that that example that Sean's just mentioned here about you know going out in the car park, car park lights, <laughs> columns and stuff, and a building with lightning protection on it. I mean, big big involvement. You know, big big need to consider six two three oh five. Yeah, absolutely, and 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 I guess. Um... One of the reasons that that, that, that training and, and upskilling is so important because um, getting that message across has got to come from somewhere. You know, someone's yeah. got that message to, to people. Uh, so whether that's uh, Atlas, where I have one hat on, or whether that's Dane with my other slightly bigger hat on, uh, then you know that, that's our responsibility is to get that information to people and, and make them aware uh, and give them the knowledge so they can make better informed choices about what they do. So is Atlas a voluntary role that you do? Yes. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's pretty good. It's made up mm. of people doing voluntary stuff. That's good because that's a commitment to better the industry rather than just spank a day rate. As yeah, absolutely. We we uh, we do. Um, all of us do it for 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 the love of doing it. <laughs> for the love of that thing that nobody really understands, but some people do, yeah. and everybody needs to. Yeah. I, do you know what? It's exciting. I have to say, just having sat in these last two, it's exciting times. I think for where we're going to go with four 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 and people's understanding I just, I just yeah i just feel frustrated extra mm -hmm. frustration about our own you know committee and stuff um we spoke again we spoke to robin before um, yeah, yeah. this one and he was basically we talked we asked him about jpel about his work about the way it goes and he just he looked like a man that had been fighting a war against people who just didn't want to kind of 
Well, um, you know my view, you and that is, is embrace as, it. As a as a ele uh, electrician, an engineer, an end user, yeah. all the roles I've ever had in my career, I think the JPL system is a broken system. Yeah. I think it needs to be thrown yeah. in the bin, scrapped, and I think a new system needs to be re replacing it with fresh fresh hearts and minds, um, rather than the current setup we currently have. Which, in my view, as an end user of that document, yeah, it's it's not it doesn't work for us anymore. Yeah, I mean, for me personally, moving forward, I'm going to spend extra time looking at 6305. I'm going to anticipate yeah. and look forward to this academy opening up. I'm going to desperately seek an offer to come and ha check it out. Yes, uh, yes, yeah, that offer still CP yeah. yeah, CPD. We will be there. We will be there at the earliest opportunity to embrace and take in, and then hopefully, you know, recommend. This opportunity for electrician, Careful, Dave, yeah. end up getting our second fixing, <laughs> we can have <their> second fixing <laughs> then, and testing everything at this rate. With, with that extra understanding, we can then start to expect more from 7671. Yes, and yeah. we can only, you know, that'll only start happening if more of us start to ask for more. Well, I'll tell you what, this, this has taught me is when Amendment 2 comes out, DPC, which should be end of the year, yeah. um, or sooner. Um, I am going to focus quite a bit of my efforts asking lots of questions on lightning protection systems and earthing and integration, even if there is no change. Um, but I know I know they're talking about found foundation electrodes, which we didn't even get into on this podcast. No, we didn't even get into that one. Or, did we? or rolling electrodes. spheres and what they are. Um, no. But I think we should probably do foundation earthing and rolling spheres on another podcast on another day. Um, and um, yeah. And then, yeah. which again means just to add a bit of continuity, we know that the foundation of the electrode came in the draft, was pulled out the draft, but we know with the agenda of 60364 8 going down the prosumer avenue, islanding foundation of the electrode is going to come back into bait in the future amendment, either the next one or the one after that, isn't it? Yeah. Floating yeah. neutrals, huge issue. We can't uh, ignore it. Huge issues. So, yeah, it, it's inevitable. Yeah. Bang on! It is inevitable, um, and I agree. I agree, and and we have to be we have to be um, quick witted and smart enough to solve the problem where the problem can be solved. It's not going to be you know on a block of flats in Muswell Hill. That's going to need a bit more of a systems approach mm. for the benefit of everybody there, um, and that's where it's going to get really conflicted because electricians are going to go, well, I've got one flat that's going to be generating and benefiting this in the top floor. But how do I get this prosumer earthing system in? Mm -hmm. I can't ask the residents to pay for it, even though they will benefit from it. So it, it, it's, there's going to be some bits of it that implementation is going to be very, very complex. Um, but again, it's all learning. It's all development. It's at the end of the day, it's never been more exciting to work in building services, the electrical industry and to develop your understanding. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. it really. Um, anyway, I'm going to shut now. John, sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, so we'll probably cover those other things um, another time because we've been going on for far too long already on this one. <laughs> so, sorry. But, uh, <laughs> as is usually the case on these podcasts, uh, what starts out as a simple list of things turned into a huge mammoth pile of stuff and it goes into uh, far things which we uh, didn't even consider in the first place. But, but it's interesting stuff. That's the that problem. is indeed interesting. And that's kind of one of the points of doing these so that we can explore these areas and uh, basically get people to think about things in a different way that they may not have considered it before so uh, any final thoughts from anybody or have we pretty much covered everything well, i think i've said my bit i'll just say look uh sean thank you for coming on uh, no problem. and yeah um please don't be a stranger and when we ask you to come on do another one please 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 come on because yeah we've got some more to talk about with this sure no problem um my final thoughts other than thank you very much sean um this is just do you know what every time we talk about surge protection or lightning well this is our first real in-depth talking about lightning protection lightning yeah um the last two of these have blown me away they have melted my brain in a good way as a client i am incredibly thankful for some of the golden nuggets you've given me and i hope contractors pass on some of these golden nuggets um <laughs> I, I am excited at the uh, concept of understanding more about Atlas, which I think we should go into more depth. And hopefully, because what I've just taken, I've taken a whole page of notes. Um, I think we definitely, if you will come back, we'll talk about rolling spheres, foundation electrodes. Yep. But, and also, I think we should talk about the good work Atlas are doing mm -hmm. as well. And maybe explore more about the membership and how that, how electrical contractors can maybe engage more uh, and mm -hmm. understand more. Um, and also, I think we should probably move that one until we've got a bit more of an update on your training center as well so that we can inform yeah. people but um blown away is an understatement 
Mm. So thank you. No problem. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, that's uh, pretty much it for this time then. So, uh, again, thanks for listening, everybody. And uh, you can find the E5 group on Instagram and also on YouTube as well. And if you're watching on YouTube, do check in the description of the video so you can find links to various things we've discussed here and plenty of other things as well. So I'm JW, and I say thanks for listening. Cheers, John. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.